Welcome. This is today's edition of From Trenton to You. I'm Assemblywoman Myla J.C. representing Morris and Essex counties. And today I'm really excited to have with me two people who have brought legislation that I introduced, oh, six, seven years ago mm -hmm. to life. Today you're going to see what can really happen when great ideas uh, come to fruition. So the first person I'd like to introduce is Rosemary Knab, who is the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning, and her colleague Tim Panabianco, director of technology and planning. So first of all, tell me a little bit about yourselves, and then we'll talk about the Center for Teaching and Learning. Thank you. My name is Rosemary Knab, and I am director of research and operations for the Center for Teaching and Learning, and. Um, it is my unique pleasure to actually work for the center because many years ago I actually helped to design it. Uh -huh. And Tim? Tim Panabianco, the Director of Technology and Planning at the Center for Teaching and Learning. I was the first employee at the center and uh, it was, it's been my pleasure to serve there for the last five years working with teachers as they've progressed using our materials in our program. So I, uh, I happen to know a lot about the center but our viewers don't. Can you tell us what is the Center for Teaching and Learning? Absolutely. Uh, the New Jersey Center for Teaching and Learning is a nonprofit organization created by the NJEA uh, around 2007. At the time, NJEA was thinking that teachers' voices were getting drowned out mm -hmm. in the conversation about how to make schools better, and that it was time to bring those voices back because as you know if you want to improve the medical field or the legal field you would go to doctors and lawyers well if you want to make schools better the best way that to do that is through teacher-led school improvement efforts our, our executive director Dr. Robert Goodman is a teacher at Bergen Tech in Teterboro and our mission uh, and our board of directors at the center is a very diverse board we have certainly representatives from uh, teacher union unions, but we also have foundations, representatives of higher ed, we have mm -hmm. the business community represented. And the idea about bringing them in is so that we could make these changes and help schools get better with the help of lots of strategic partners who also had a vested interest in wanting to see that kids in New Jersey had the best education possible. Um, our, our main mission that we try to, uh, that we address is we believe in a social justice issue that regardless of where a student lives or what his, his or her economic circumstances are, they deserve the opportunity to take very challenging courses that will lead them to be college and career ready. So in everything that we do, we make sure that it, it is open access and free and available uh, to children no matter where uh, they happen to be living. And we also believe that um, everything we do has to contribute to the economic uh, well-being of the nation. Right. And, and that, yeah. And, yeah, and that's something I want to talk about a little bit later in the program. Okay. Um, the whole idea of promoting STEM education. Everybody's talking about it, but we're actually doing it here Correct. in New Jersey. So I understand that the Center for Teaching and Learning is now the number one producer of physics teachers in the nation. How did that happen? Well, that's right. We, uh, about five years ago, uh, we had uh, early success with Bergen County Technical Schools in Teterboro, a vocational school. They had been using the PSI approach before we started calling it PSI and based on the results there where physics was now the first subject that students learned in ninth grade we knew that we had to take that to more schools so to do that schools had to switch their science sequence but a fundamental problem was that most schools did not have a sufficient number of physics teachers with the help of the legislature and the traders to teachers bill in 2009 mm -hmm. we were able to go out and create more physics teachers from existing teachers in these schools we took successful teachers who knew the schools and the students and turned them th into a physics teacher through a 300-hour program, a very intensive program, uh, where they still were held to the same standard as traditional physics teachers. As a result, instead of only 10 new physics teachers a year that the state would produce, we've been able to do about 25 a year every year. Right, and I, I found those numbers to be astounding. Um, the fact that we were only producing one or two physics teachers a year here in the state of New Jersey out of our higher ed programs. Um, and when I thought about it, and I thought about my own experience and my kids' experiences, um, not everybody gets to physics, because usually we start with biology, and then chemistry, 
and then perhaps physics or environmental science or something else, mm -hmm. right? So talk a little bit about flipping the sequence. You, you know, Myla, it's one of those things that absolutely frightens adults. <laughs> they think, I never took physics or physics was only for the smart kids when I went to school. Well, in reality, the science sequence was established mm. back in the 1800s, before modern physics and chemistry was even invented. So what we needed to do was to tell the, uh, an interesting story about science so that there's a physics, chemistry, and biology sequence. And Tim is going to tell us a little bit more why that, that sequence makes sense. And two reasons. First off, everybody's very focused on mathematics. Right. And what people often misconceive is that physics has to be taught with calculus. That's not the, not, not the truth. Indeed, you can teach physics with algebra. And algebra is really being taught in eighth and ninth grade. Right. So if you want to strengthen algebra skills, give students a reason to use algebra. That's what physics can do. Additionally, uh, physics is really the foundation of chemistry, and chem chemistry is really the foundation of biology. Modern biology is much different than 100 years ago when the decision was made to make it biology, chemistry, and physics as a science sequence. Right, so what you're saying is uh, largely the reason that we're doing it the way we're doing it is because we've always done it that way. Correct. Right, and as we know, change is always difficult. We always resist change. But uh, my understanding is that this change has led to some terrific results. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this looks on the state level, national, and connected to international uh, approaches to teaching? Well, uh, you know, as, as Tim said, uh, being the number one producer of physics teachers has really gotten the attention of lots of other states and actually other countries are mm -hmm. now taking a look at what this and they like to call it by the way the New Jersey experience. Oh, all right. So um, <laughs> our reach has begun much further than we ever anticipated. Um, intuitively when you talk to science teachers they will recognize when they sit and think for a while that this sequence makes sense that they can take their kids to higher levels of learning um, and uh, it just becomes a much more natural story for them mm -hmm. uh, so because our courses by the way that we teach our students are free and open source so that anybody anywhere in the world can take a look at them we are getting um, we're getting people from around the world to actually go into the center, look at the courses, download them, and use them. Wow. So our reach has become very, very broad. And the conversation now is becoming, how do we make more students take physics, and how do we reverse the science sequence? So why do we want more kids to take physics? Well, physics is actually the foundation of most STEM careers. If you go through to the uh, records... You can repeat that. Oh, it, it is. Physics is the foundation for most STEM careers. Right. If you look at a course catalog for a college, most STEM careers will call for physics as a, back, as a background, si a basic science. It may call for chemistry, it may call for biology, but more often it will call for physics. And so in looking forward in, in terms of the economy and where the jobs are, it's my understanding from talking to you and, and to others uh, at the center uh, that science, technology, engineering, math, you need a background in those areas to access some of the very best jo and most plentiful jobs right right now. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And, and we do anticipate also, one of the other reasons why this science sequence, by the way, is so important is most people hear about the United States and international comparisons and, and it looks t to the world that our students actually don't do that well on mm -hmm. international comparisons. Right. Quite frankly, that is because the rest of the world for many years had already reversed the sequence. So we were hanging oh. out here doing biology, chemistry, physics, and the rest of the world was doing physics, chemistry, and biology. So for our students to become competitive in the modern world, the sequence needed to be reversed, and they needed to be able to have more in-depth challenging courses in in those particular subjects. We know and we anticipate that as we <coughs> change the sequence that our students will begin to do better on international comparisons. Now I did not know that. So that's, you know, it, it's reassuring in a way to understand, have a better understanding of why we're trailing. Mm -hmm. And even better to know that there's a way to reverse that. So right now we've got some pretty tough economic times here in the state of New Jersey. And as a legislator, I always have to ask myself, you know, can we afford it? 
okay? So, because obviously we have a budget deficit, which seems to be growing <laughs> daily. Um, so the program sounds great, but can we afford it and how can we uh, take this to more districts in the state? Well, y there's two things that could help mm -hmm. uh, in, in that regard. The first is that since uh, we believe that all of the courses that we have should be free and open source. So rather than just put materials on a website, we actually put a fully aligned course uh, on the, the uh, NJCTL website. In fact, we don't have a course. We have all K-12 to math and science freely accessible on the web. So that instead of investing in new textbooks, we're encouraging uh -huh. in the districts that we work with <laughs> go right to the website and download and teach right from the courses that are there. So that, that is uh, one way. The second way is because as a nonprofit foundation we've um, drawn in a lot of interest from other private foundations who would like to support the teacher training piece of this, mm -hmm. we're able to help districts when we can find our corporate sponsors to help us to actually do, do some of the teacher training, we have one foundation partner who also looks to provide the smart boards and the technology that's needed to be able uh, to provide our program. So it's actually a cost savings for districts. I see. I see. Tim, do you want to weigh in on that? I was going to just add another piece to that. Yep. And, you know, in fact, th this has been so, um, so accessible to, to students, parents, and teachers that we had about 2.2 million page views on our website in the last year. And that's the way 2.2 million? That's right. Wow. So there's a lot of people accessing this across the state and even nationally and internationally. About 177 countries have been accessing our content. Um, so currently the buzz is about the Common Core. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about that? Are your courses aligned to the Common Core is that, or is that another step that districts would have to take? All of our courses are aligned to Common Core and that's what makes them so appealing around the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you get to high school, our high school math classes courses are not only aligned to Common Core, but they're al aligned to the advanced placement curriculum, oh, which is okay. what the challenging part of this when students take the courses. And so, as far as science, our, uh, th the next new set of standards that's coming in is something called the Next Generation Science Standards. The science classes that we have, courses that we have now, and the ones we're developing for lower elementary are all going to be aligned with the next generation science standards, and the high school courses are aligned to the advanced placement science courses. Okay. All right. So, so if a student starts out in ninth grade taking physics along with algebra, then that student would progress to chemistry, and then to biology, and then to an AP course, or would they take the AP physics course before then? Well, let me, let me Explain elaborate. Explain that to me. This is actually an important piece of what we've been doing with schools. Okay. The course sequence now becomes, for all students, physics, chemistry, and biology. So uh -huh. they see all the science before they leave high school. Now, on the other hand, with this sequence, becomes a very efficient pathway to getting a lot of advanced placement coursework under their belt. So in the sophomore year of their, their high school experience, after they've taken physics, while they're enrolled in chemistry, they take AP Physics, oh. if they so elect, <coughs> and many students are. And then the following year, they have the election of taking AP Chemistry while taking Biology. In senior year, they could take AP Biology. And so this, in this sequence, students have lots of access to AP courses, and there's no c gap between the first year course mm -hmm. and the second year course where students would lose a lot of knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, so, and so we should tell our audience, too, that currently, uh, under New Jersey law, students graduating from a public high school have to have three years of a lab science. So this clearly would fit that, those requirements, correct? Absolutely. Okay, so let's go back to the fact that we need a lot more physics teachers. Where are they coming from? Well, I'll, I'll tackle that if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, these physics teachers in our program, the way that we're creating them is we're taking successful teachers within these school districts, like for instance, Irvington, Newark, Patterson, uh, Bergenfield, these districts give us very strong teachers who are successful in their district and we turn them into physics teachers. So we're not going out and recruiting physicists because there just aren't that many to begin with and we're not convinced they're all be they're going to be very good teachers. Right. We're taking teachers who are already successful and turning them into physics teachers. And how has the response been? Pretty overwhelming. We yeah. were actually pretty shocked 
the first year that we did this that teachers would stand up and say, well, let me participate in 300 hours. Let me learn all of this. But this pr seems pretty daunting. Mm -hmm. uh, we were really pretty shocked that that first summer after with very little notice, there were about 40 teachers who from uh, Newark, Jersey City and, P and Patterson who said, sure, let me learn the content that I need. And by the way, at the end of the 300 hours, these teachers still have to pass the teacher exams in their content area. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy <coughs> course. It's a very, very rigorous course. But you know what teachers, most teachers are lifelong learners. After they do something for a very long time, they want to take on the challenge of being able to learn something new. Uh, a, a unique piece to our program, too, is you learn about a third of the physics content, and then while you're learning the other two-thirds, you're actually teaching physics to students. We don't wait for you. You begin to teach the introductory courses to physics while you're learning the advanced physics content. So in a year and a half in a very intensive program, you can earn an endorsement to be a physics teacher. And this actually reminds me of, of uh, an experience early on when we had first introduced the legislation and we had a hearing. I think you remember this. And uh, there was a principal there from uh, one of the high schools in Newark, one of the smaller ones. And she 